Okay. Um, so the series of uh, challenges pertaining to the organization, sharing, and reuse of archaeological data, which are often collectively referred to as the discipline's curation crisis or data deluge, have highlighted the wide array of practices that underlie data's construction, management, dissemination, and reuse. In general, existing uh, data publishing frameworks, which implicitly consider the data, the data archive as the natural resting place for data, tend to prioritize a mechanistic or linear framework that does not adequately reflect or facilitate recursive, reflexive, or iterative aspects of archaeological practices and workflows, in which meanings are continually described, reaffirmed, transformed, or challenged. In my view, part of uh, the disconnect between the increased availability of open archaeological data and low rates of reuse stems from the multiple meanings that data has in the context of archaeological research, which are often conflated. So at the same time, archaeological data may denote the observable set of characteristics, properties, or features pertaining to objects of interest, the evidential uh, basis upon which inferred claims are either verified or refuted, or the series made about objects of interest which are inscribed upon some medium and that can be consulted, accessed, used, or used as stand-ins for objects that they have been constructed to represent. So I, I consider this third facet to be particularly interesting because it relates to a broader set of records and activities um, that enable archaeology to be performed in a collaborative, in a collaborative manner, um, using, a, using a wide variety, vri wide variety of tools and by integrating multiple methods and approaches. So things like tags, labels, scrap notes, stories, hand gestures, jokes, journal entries, memory cards, shell scripts, and outdated total station hardware drivers are they all bind uh, parts of a project together. They enable work to be conducted in various places in, at various times and by various people who hold mutual goals and research questions in their minds. While these elements of archaeological information, uh, uh, while these are elements of archaeological information systems play important roles in the construction of a constitution of archaeological archives, the ways that they are selectively, strategically, or subconsciously implemented to, uh, to relate distributed experiences should be a, a major focus. Um, the overall goals of my ongoing dissertation uh, is to are to consider archaeological data sharing in a similar way, akin to the collaborative practices that are already implemented to relate different kinds of knowledge and experiences within projects. Drawing from the fields of science technology studies and the sociology of scientific knowledge, which examine research as cultural practice, my approach is to document uh, the collaborative and, communi and communicative practice practices that enable uh, commu uh, communal archives to be uh, collectively curated and to highlight how they effectively facilitate further work. So um, I base my research on uh, data collected through various means, namely observational methods, uh, observational records, uh, uh, episodic interviews, retrospective interviews, and uh, document, document analysis. So observational records are largely comprised of videos taken from multiple perspectives, supplemented by handwritten notes. Uh, and they allow me to relate activities to prior events or to events that follow. Uh, regarding, uh, while, uh, recording the, while recording the work, I conduct episodic interviews that, uh, el to elicitate participants' perspectives as they work. And retro retrospective interviews uh, are used outside of, of typical field work, work settings and are meant to uh, determine participants' views on more general or relatively undocumentable aspects of the work. Finally, I examine components of information systems like forms, photographs, labels, and database schemas uh, and reports as they, as they are used to encapsulate and communicate meanings uh, among users and over time. So data has been collected over three, over three years pertaining to the work being done at an archaeological project in southern Europe. Like many other archaeological projects, uh, this research, the research team and composition, uh, the research team composition and the, government and the governance structure follows a common model with a director uh, who coordinates the project, uh, very specialists who are called in by the director to offer their, their experience and, and insights a series of trench supervisors to lead excavation and coordinate data collection, and excavators who are uh, usually less experienced students who operate under the guidance of their assigned trench supervisors. So the project, this project in particular, uh, relies extensively on archaeological surface surveys and assessments of the landscape, 
and it uh, it, uh, it, it digital uh, digital technological tools and methods are also being increasingly uh, implemented uh, are also being increasingly implemented as informed by examples uh, implemented elsewhere, um, and that reinforces their subsequent adoption by others. So, uh, like any uh, it, it, like any other archaeological project, it also addresses common underlying research questions and constantly compares the findings with similar work occurring elsewhere. Um, I, th I consider this a, a very salient case study for these reasons and allows me to capture the pragmatic, multifaceted, and drawn out ways in which archaeologists coordinate their work. I'm collecting data also at two other case studies, but I will not be able to talk about these today. Um, the identities of the, it tells me know that the identities of the, project con of the project and of its contributors are being kept confidential uh, and pseudonyms are being assigned to each individual. So what you see, then there, there'll be names and some places on this, but they don't really represent where this work was done. Um, and uh, relevant segments have been extracted from dozens of hours of f uh, video footage, uh, which have been compiled into a few episodes, which I'll be showing you. So please keep in mind that this is uh, still very preliminary work and finer grained qualitative uh, coding and uh, more intensive theory building and comparisons with other case studies uh, are not accounted for here, but will be uh, done in the future and presented in the future. Uh, I'll also be happy to discuss technical aspects of this work at a, you know, uh, at a break or uh, over a coffee or a beer sometime. So moving on to, I guess, the first episode. Uh, the first episode is, uh, it demonstrates how uh, the constitution of new records occurs as part of a, bro uh, as part of a, a broader project framework, which novices like Jane, who is a promising student, must learn to be a part of. So I'm particularly interested um, in uh, how Jane engages with and ascribes meaning to material stuff as it emerges throughout the digging process and how uh, the locus she identifies begins to take on a life of its own. So in this brief conversation, Jane explains how she identifies and differentiates a new context that she is coming down on. Um, like any other archaeologist, uh, sorry, um, one interesting aspect of this uh, exchange is a series of uh, gestures that she pairs with her speech to convey what she means to say. So she kicks boulders and she, uh, and she literally points out relations to uh, previous experiences and that she deems relevant and she ascribes certain aspects of the soil by miming the ways that she would interact with them. So I'm just gonna flip through some of these. Uh, so uh, this conversation highlights a, uh, uh, hi uh, this conversation highlights elements of a particular perspective. Specifically, Jane refers to commonly used characteristics outlined on the project's ex excavation manual, and she draws from experiences working in tr other trenches that others may not share. More generally, she describes the context change only in terms of her interactions with it, and as framed by her particular role within the project. Um, after, um, after talking to me about the potential context change, Jane discusses, her, discusses it with her trend supervisor, Basil, who also happens to be the project director. To quickly summarize the entire exchange, Jane explains her interpretation of the soil to Basil, and after he evaluates uh, Jane's account more closely, he provides her with instructions for how to proceed. Again, gestures play a big role in identifying and relating uh, entities of mutual interest, um, and the supervisor translates Jay's experience into more nominal terms. Uh, and as Basil makes the decisions to record these observations, uh, uh, so, so yes, so uh, that, that, that's depending on, on, sorry, to reiterate, the supervisor translate, Basil translates her experiences into nominal terms and makes decisions to record based on, on, those, on, on, on that nominalization. So the decision uh, reveals a tension that is common among trench supervisors who must balance the responsibility to adequately record uh, their trenches with the need to make, to, to make speedier progress. That's something, I, I guess that speaks to the questions uh, asked earlier. Um, throughout the entire conversation, uh, Jane, aff um, Jane um, affirms that she understands what, what Basil is saying and builds confidence in her ability to carry out uh, her supervisor's instructions. So the supervisor is reliant on the excavator's ability to suitably recognize and report her experiences. This is significantly enhanced when they share similar experiences and talk about them explicitly, like this conversation. Um, this is demonstrated in a, in a segment of a retrospective interview 
uh, when Jane revealed her own perspective on how she learned to see context changes. So she revealed that she initially found it difficult to train her eye to see to see what they're seeing, and they seems to refer to more senior uh, archaeologists, such as her supervisor, the director, and Alf, who's the field ar the field director trained as a geoarchaeologist. Uh, this relates to the scene we just witnessed, where Jane explained her interpretation of the soil to her supervisor, which he then responded to with tentative agreement, and also paired with his own gestures and intonations, which with that subtly communicate his agreement or disagreement. As Basil seems to have predicted, the context did not end up changing that day. Um, however, the tentative decision to proceed as if a change uh, in context was imminent left residual traces on recording sheets in the database and in the final trench report. The tentativity and ambiguity uh, experienced while excavating this trench is one of its more notable properties, actually. Uh, but this is still lumped with two other somewhat ambiguous contexts into what is referred to as a lithostratigraphic unit, which effectively lumps them into a more concretely defined group. We can take away a few important things from this episode, such as the fact that project-specific documentation guidelines help establish... Oh, I might have jumped it. Missed one. Um, that that do documentation guidelines help establish consistent uh, terminology and descriptive parameters, and that the use of formal or, nom or nominal tech terminology effectively detaches the locus from the experiences of its constitution. The person doing the recording relies on the sensory experiences of the excavator, as I also noted, um, which must be communicated effectively. So the second episode um, is prepared, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is set in the museum, in the museum context, uh, Jolene is a lithics analyst whose job is to uh, examine uh, tool technology and typology. Anna is another lithicist, lithicist with a geoarchaeological background who focuses more on differentiating raw materials. Um, Anna has been developing a scheme for uh, clearly delineate raw material varieties present at the site. However, she's only here for a couple weeks and Jolene wants to learn this scheme to um, ensure that she could adopt it once, she's, once uh, Anna's away. So, however, so Anna is having a hard time communicating her thoughts to Jolene. Part of the disconnect, I think, uh, is due to the misunderstanding on Jolene's part regarding what it would take to properly characterize the raw materials. Jolene hopes that the scheme can be rendered in a, as a series of reducible factors, which would simplify the process of matching samples with the, pre, with the predefined raw material types. However, it seems that uh, the system embodies some tacit knowledge drawn from Anna's geoarchaeological training, which cannot be easily transferred. Uh, the terms that Jolene understands as nominal parameters are actually part of a system of knowledge that can take a long time over, over a career to effectively communicate. Um, however, they, they are also methodologically necessary uh, and enable records to be recorded and subsequently analyzed. Um, in an extension of this conversation, uh, Jolene proposes that she could play around with a small subset of material and have Anna check her work. However, she does, sti she does this still while focusing on nominalized characteristics and, stri and, and still does not fu fully have a b the bundle of knowledge necessary uh, 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 that, 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 matches Anna's, uh, that matches Anna's intent. Um, so some takeaways from this episode. Uh, are that uh, the raw material schema represents uh, uh, the raw material schema represents, represents a methodological tool used to facilitate the production uh, of a stable data set to be used in further work. The schema does not represent the sum of the knowledge about distinctions between raw materials, and that small scale or low stakes play uh, is con is considered uh, by by the people involved to be a, a, a way to practice and test one's abilities. Um, the third and final episode I want to show today um, um, it also, it's also based is also largely oriented towards uh, museum uh, finds analysis work um, due to the fact that essentially all the material comes from mixed or colluvial contexts at this site uh, finds analysts relied on uh, uh, comparisons with similar material found elsewhere in the region in order to draw meaningful uh, conclusions about it. Uh, moreover, there was a, a, a massive portion of, of, the, of the finds were extremely weathered, which makes it difficult to identify key features that would normally help date the artifacts. The ambiguity of, of, of that resulted from these factors 
uh, was, a, was a large source of frustration, which made it extremely difficult to move forward with confidence. To help with this, uh, the project invited an expert, Denise Poirier, that's a fake name, don't bother looking her up, uh, who, who made her career by publishing very similar assemblages to visit for a few days. Uh, so it was hoped that uh, she would be able to confirm whether the, ana whether the analysis conducted by the regular staff might conflict with the broader framework. Um, so if she strongly disagreed with the assessments made pertaining to finds that she is extremely familiar with, the staff might reconsider uh, how they made such determinations and uh, continue their work as informed by expert opinion, right? So while Denise did agree, th uh, well, while Denise did agree with most of the project's assessments, uh, she also cast doubt on whether the entire project, whether an entire period is represented uh, at the site at all. Uh, preliminary absolute dates were consistent with her view, which compounded its effects. Ooh, uh, yeah. There's a little bit of an alignment problem, but sorry about that. Um, so there, the, um, the, prelim there were the issues with the preliminary dating that compounded the effects of, 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 of her doubt. Um, and uh, together they overwhelmed uh, prior assessments which were, which were formed on the basis of a more malleable and less authoritative framework. Uh, consul consultation with the person who effectively created the most uh, authoritative framework was considered to be a way to recalibrate their own view and to ensure that they are, that they are well aligned. Uh, moreover, the, the idea of experimenting through low stakes play was raised as a potential means of intervention and for reflection. So um, this is a, this, what you see on the slide now is of a, of a previous conversation before her visit where they were preparing uh, for, for, her, for uh, the expert's visit. The museum staff, uh, 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 the muse museums, museum staff uh, discuss um, uh, 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 tried to try to assess what what uh, Denise already knows about the project, whether uh, she would be informed about um, the analytical processes that are that are, that occur as data is prepared, uh, as the lithics are prepared for their for their um, for uh, to be to be read, and whether she would be aware of the unique set of circumstances under which the materials were collected in the field. In effect, this conversation amounts to preparing uh, for a dialogue. Um, Jolene thinks about what, it, what is to be laid out, on, uh, laid out for Denise's assessment, and in doing so, uh, sets, sets uh, and in doing so, sets the scope of the consultation. The group tries to uh, determine what Denise already knows, so that they can emphasize particular aspects, or demonstrate, or to demonstrate, uh, uh, or to demonstrate uh, uh, targeted, uh, uh, targeted aspects of, of that, that, that they that or to, to target particular aspects. Um, that they would like to know more about. They also want to ensure that the dialogue is balanced, since ultimately this, this, uh, this will amount to an effort to align a somewhat the somewhat fuzzy results of a particularly tricky set of material with a commonly accepted and authoritative viewpoints. Uh, Jolene has to demonstrate that she values Denise's contributions, but must also show that she is a capable lithicist in her own right. Despite the problematic uh, mis misidentification of Mesolithic artifacts that seems to have uh, surfaced thanks to Denise's consultation, she helped guide the staff by advising them um, about how to proceed with the extremely ambiguous uh, and weathered material that has come to characterize the entire the, the, the site's assemblage. Um, According to Basil, uh, the, the result was a boost in confidence that allowed the material to be uh, processed more quickly and with greater enthusiasm. Denise's visit was considered to be uh, a pivotal moment uh, since the ability to be more decisive helped generate the kind of, the kind of data set that was, that was needed to continue on to subsequent steps of work and which would turn into the production of what Basil considered to be respectable research outputs. The takeaways from this episode are that uh, there is greater confidence um, deemed, uh, placed in typological frameworks that are backed by more concrete material arrangements, such as those generated or produced in, in, uh, in absolute dating labs, like spectro spe spectrographic labs. Um, the, the effort made to align the project's typological frameworks with others can be understood as a dialogue or conversation of sorts. 
Um, and that's, and the, the director knows what kinds of research outputs uh, he or she wants to produce and recognizes that data must be recorded in a very particular way in order to produce uh, those desired outputs. And finally, um, again, uh, this was also hinted at in, in after the episode, after the second episode, that small scale, low stakes play is identified as a, as a way to foreshadow potential snags and might, that might arise if left unchecked. So um, going over the series of takeaways um, drawn from each episode, uh, we can pull out a few broader trends. First is that the production of concrete and stable records involves, the, involves characterizing the phenomenon of interest in nominal terms and depreciating information about the experience of the objects becoming. However, these schemas are also needed to extricate information locked up in people's heads and to render in a way that is, in, in ways that enable further work to be done with it. Projects, organizational structures, and, these, uh, and the staggered tempos of research uh, a research timelines uh, helps put distance between, between the experience of objects uh, constitution, the creation of records about them, and the subsequent stages in characterization and, and characteriza of characterization and analysis. And I, I don't think this is necessarily a detriment, this, this distance between, uh, between um, uh, the, uh, the, the data's construction and its reuse. Uh, since the kinds of outputs that are valued seems to depend on having desituated data or data removed from the experience of its production. Um, finally, uh, uh, playful, low-stakes experiences are designed to compress extended ranges of activities or experiences into shorter spans of, spans of time um, so that potential outputs of these claims, uh, of these claims or activities can be, can be uh, projected with low risk. And so working procedures can be, can be, can be uh, tweaked accordingly. Uh, further work needs to be done to um, more thoroughly document collaborative, collaborative practices among archaeologists. Um, and uh, these preliminary, preliminary insights still need to be contextualized in relation to broader data sharing frameworks. However, I believe that a lot, a lot may be accomplished uh, by reframing data sharing as a discursive process rather than as a finalizing act. Inasmuch as archaeology is and has always been a collaborative endeavor, archaeologists have always shared data. It has just been limited to those who have already engaged in conversation and who are already familiar with the local circumstances, unique, unique challenges, and discursive frameworks needed to make sense of it. Making spreadsheets and machine-readable metadata available online does not really accomplish the same kind of communication uh, that are needed to make data useful. Um, so moving forward, um, I believe it is necessary to develop infrastructures, protocols, and attitudes oriented towards opening up not only the data, but the collaborative conversations that surround it as well. So um, by drawing from already established norms um, and strategies identified and uh, uh, so by, by drawing from already established norms um, and uh, that, are, that are identified and uh, dissected through grounded research, such as this, uh, it may be possible to extend uh, the kinds of conversations that uh, already exist. Um, and I think that this will have the effect of ensuring that work which derives um, from a project takes, uh, uh, sorry, um, I believe that this will have the effect of ensuring that work which derives from a project takes part in a continuous and richly textured curatorial process um, undertaken to maintain the project's Sorry, I, uh, I, I, th I think that this will have the effect of extending the, the curatorial process to include uh, work that is done uh, after uh, the, the work is, is published through a project. Uh, I, I don't know, I think that's all I have. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Zachary. That was a really interesting um, look into your project. Um, uh, talk about following the, um, the process of archaeological interpretation in detail. Very interesting. Uh, I'm sure that we have uh, questions for Zachary. Yes. Yes, uh, just a question about your uh, point three. Um, when you're talking about the project of, of yeah. just a question <laughs> about the project organizational structure, 
Um, do you think that we should embed in our data processing the political and hierarchical structure of our uh, work on data acquisition at least? Meaning that when you're talking about the boss, and then the, the worker and the way they interact and the way it influences the creation, then of course in the long term the creation of it. Do you think we have to embed this process or at least to highlight a little bit that? And then of course this also, not answer, but this is also a way to, to put the influence of the machine in it. Sorry, uh, that's a good question. Um, I was, um, I think that those are, definitely important aspects to uh, to consider putting in like including in uh, when sharing data uh, I I think that I, I w I'm not so much I, like, I, I believe that data should be like there you should be sharing data in a formal like if it's if it's spreadsheet data it has to be shared in a, in a way that will make it useful but there's always going to be documentation about that data that that doesn't necessarily um, uh, isn't necessarily machine readable, such as you know these 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 views about you know the political context or the or the uh, uh, the uh, I mean, uh, the circumstances in which the project is conducted. Um, I think that this this sort of um, this sort of uh, this sort of discourse is probably best. Um, Discussed in a way that allows uh, allows people to actually, you know, talk about it, you know, and communicate it. And it communicate it, it, it's, it's something that I think is is more oriented towards human human interaction, not so much about hum machine readable interaction. Um, although uh, I, I I I would consider that maybe there are ways to to you know relate this information. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of uh, you know through. The, through conceptual models that accommodate for, for these sorts of things, but um, I'm more thinking about human human interactions and how these how we can facilitate that and, and have that complement uh, uh, data sharing that uh, it, that is um, that 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 is is uh, geared towards the re re digital reuse. I'm not sure if that answered. Addressed, yeah. Yes, thank you for that fascinating paper, and uh, I admire the richness of your uh, your your data, uh, your the verbal data, the answers that the. Um, archaeologist gave you and um, and I wondered whether um, there are aspects of knowledge that you encounter that lie beyond their words about them and so for example you mentioned the gestures and so on and I was going to ask you is have you ever encountered any sense in which the the gestures um, contradict or or tell you more than the words do or, or are they just kind of supporting the words um, so how important are these gestures and these actions um, I I think that um, there's only so much that I as an observer can get out of, of, of people like I can't read people's minds uh, people need to say or communicate what I, I, I am limited based because I can only record, I can only talk about what what I know and I know what they they tell me, right? Um, and in some ways, uh, I'm, um, I, I'm I'm drawing, um, I'm drawing I'm theorizing about why these gestures are relevant and I'm identifying them based upon my own uh, informed understanding about what they might what they might do to support. Uh, to support their, support their communication, um, I I believe I mean I I, I think it's it's I, I I I could look out for these you know for for gestures that might have um, um, that might have value in their own right 
um, outside, but but I, I fear that that I wouldn't necessarily be doing justice to uh, to what um, what they're saying through them, and um, yeah. Right, so yes, I'm, I'm supposed to know some of that stuff and because we've discussed it many times with Zach, but uh, this is a question really and I, it was really interesting how you juxtaposed things that somehow linked this talk and this kind of research with earlier things that we heard before because it's like trying to navigate again a, a relationship between uh, uh, some archaeologists or archaeologists as knowing subjects on the one hand and some other thing that is really things. It may be tools, it may be things, etc. And uh, in this, you said that, that there's this interplay between uh, terminology or even like a competition, like a tug of war between terminology that's coming in, right? And on the other hand, the experience or the primary experience that comes in as well. And you just talk about this uh, small stakes play that uh, the, the junior people in the team use in order to be able to somehow satisfy this project uh, concept, etc. But I would want to ask you is whether you see this game of play between terminology on the one hand and their primary experience that is very sensorial and you know just very situated etc as something that really plays an important role in shaping that terminology so my interest is how concepts and categories like they say oh this is that this is a post hole this is something else how this comes into the process through these interactions that you're witnessing um, I um one thing that didn't really show here uh, was that you know the the raw material schema that uh, Anna was producing went through many different iterations, um, and it, it was modified as as people were actually going through it because people started to realize, as you know, after for, after a couple hundred samples of a, of a very very large um, uh, assemblage of material uh, that. You know, they were really going for type B and type E. You know, and there, there were certain um, emphasis that on, on two things, and that when there was ambiguity, they would choose one or the other. So they they were they reconsidered how to um, split B into another two, and they added F to the end. You know, to, a, after E as as a, as, a, as an additional type. Uh, so there there is a, a definitely a a uh, the, the the schema is being formulated continuously, um, and um, that is something that uh, you know. That's uh, uh, it's it's an it's an interesting thing to note how 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 these changes occur. Unfortunately, I don't I I I haven't I um I haven't don't think I actually recorded that aspect. Uh, it was part of a conversation, but you know, so it's, 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 there's a lot of like background information. Uh, but uh, I think that, um, yeah, I, I, I definitely look out for, I, I have, I, I, there are certain aspects of, of, of transformation I'm, I'm, that, that I have not, um, uh, that, I, that I would like to continue pursuing, yeah. me oh yeah it's working um, just a follow-up question to what Matt was saying about the gesture I was thinking you were saying that uh, you saw the same gesture being used to show the same kind of um, layer or whatever it was um, was that one person or several persons um, I focused my observations on uh, a few trenches with a few in, with a subset of the project. Um, this one person was Jane was my primary subject in the excavation uh, setting. Um, so I um, I mainly observed that with her. Mm. Um, but I, I I you know people make gestures that are similar, like you know when talking about you know how she should be leveling things out and doing that sort of sweeping motion. I saw that a few places. I couldn't necessarily, if you're, I, I, I couldn't necessarily see how that was being 
tracked or, you know, how I couldn't necessarily track how that sort of became pervasive because um, I, I was, first of all, I wasn't really looking for it at the time, but also um, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, um, Sorry, uh, my mind just went blank for a moment. It's uh, um, happened it, it, like there there are other people on other parts of the project where I wasn't really ob observing this, uh, observing people's gestures, and I can't really get to the the uh, temporal aspects of it. But it was occurring. I mean, there are certain gestures that definitely are common because there there's the uh, common references to uh, uh, commonly recognized things that. Um, tend to occur as, you know, there are site tours, people point towards, oh, that rock is named Fred now, so everyone refers to, you know, there gives, uh, refers to uh, uh, um, Fred as the, the, that one tr that killed that trench, you know, because it was too, too big. So uh, there are certain, I mean, not, maybe that's not necessarily a gesture, but it's, it's, a, it's a common, um, there's a, it's, it's a similarly common, uh, communally recognized uh, entity that just has become pervasively known in a, in a casual way. Um. It would be interesting to know if, you know, the, if this is something that is picked up from the supervisors or if this is something that, yeah, you learn at your first excavation mm -hmm. and then it just, so it's like a gesture language of yeah. field archaeology or something. I'd yeah. say it's, it's a very casual thing, you yeah, know, yeah. and it's, mm. it's a, uh, this wasn't the field school, but it had many mm -hmm. unexperienced uh, excavators. Right, right. So. It's very interesting. Yeah. Mm. Do we have any more questions? Yes, we have one more. Hi. Uh, so almost as a, as a follow-up to that, to the previous question by Asa, um, at what extent can can, can your research be, um, be generalized? So for one person, uh, this person will have certain idiosyncrasies, you know, gestures, uh, certain words, certain ways of uh, filling, uh, filler words, for example. Um, and then perhaps there is uh, like a, a supervisor level of, of um, certain terminology used in certain, certain ways of speaking, and then there's a student level of doing that. So, is there, is there a way where you can say, okay, um, at what point after so many of these interviews can you say this is the way that a certain type of people talk and, and this is the way that students talk? If, um, so I have, I have three case studies. This is one of my case studies. And um, I, I don't think the purpose of my case studies is to draw generalizations. The purpose of my case studies are to uh, get some sort of insight that might be that that is, that is salient, to, uh, and uh, I, I um, so I've, I've had pre I had other conversations with other students talking about you know how they begin to recognize things in a certain way, and uh, super casually you know not necessarily in a, in a, in a in a in an interview setting people have told me how. Um, how um, you know that 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 they that supervisors have you know sense a kind of uh, anxiety in this or apprehension that they aren't able to to directly sense or that they're that or that they they are able to but they often you know they they want to also teach and ensure that their students get that and they aren't sure if their students are really or their assistants are really you know fully comprehending it and so there's this there's this apprehension there. Um, these are things that are um, that are um, that uh, I mean I, 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 I don't necessarily think that this is I think that this is uh, generalizable if you or is, is, is general in, in relation to what this project uh, the specific circumstances of this project um, and the, 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 the scope of the project that I outlined in the beginning. It, it, it's, it has, there is something to it, but I couldn't necessarily say how broad it, it can be generalizable. Um, 
I think that as a, it captures a, like a, a moment, um, which is the moment, we, like the moment over the, well, you know, it, it was actually a three year longitudinal case study, but it captures a particular uh, uh, kind of attitude at a particular kind of project that I hope to uh, maybe more uh, clearly um, represent in, you know, in presenting the case study. Yeah.